Can we move back to to the West Coast for uh, the final presentation? Um, that is going to be done by uh, Kevin Burlingham uh, from uh, from Wood. Kevin, floor is yours. Thanks. Um, I assume you can see my screen now. Um, yes, we so can. I'm going to talk about uh, the California High Speed Rail drill shaft load testing program. Um, the original idea for the Cal uh, high speed rail in California, at least when we were starting the project um, back in 2013, um, was that they would eventually build a rail system that would connect San Francisco to Los Angeles um, in under two hours and 40 minutes trip time, um, but that they would start construction on an initial operating segment in the Central Valley. Um, and then connect to the, you know, San Jose, San Francisco area and Los Angeles. Um, overall, I'm going to be talking about our first segment that's being constructed that we're part of the design build team for that's around Fresno in, in the Central Valley. Um, this is the segment uh, we call it construction package one, the high speed rail. It's a 29 mile segment going from near Madeira down through Fresno, the southern parts of the city. Um, back in 2013, uh, Peter Perini, Zachary Parsons, joint venture, won the design bill contract for about 1.1 billion. Um, we were part of the team as the geotechnical engineers. Um, our scope included three viaduct structures one structure up in the north, it goes over the Fresno River, which is a dry creek channel up near Madeira. Um, that's about a quarter to half a mile long. It's another viaduct structure that goes over the San Joaquin River and also crosses over a UPRR railroad track south of the river on a pergola structure, kind of straddling over the tracks. Um, then the third viaduct structure is down in the south, down kind of on the south part of Fresno and it crosses over Highway 99. Um, there are also a couple of trenches in Fresno as part of the overall construction package. Um, there are also more than 20 grade separation structures crossing the high-speed rail alignment throughout the uh, way. Um, and the rest of the alignment consisted of embankment or retained fill. Very high, varying heights. Um, the design build team consisted of Tudor Perini. Uh, Parsons was the main designer. Um, we, as Wood, were the geotechnical engineers for the track alignment and the viaduct structures. Uh, Earth Mechanics was the other geotechnical engineer on the project, and they were the geotechnical engineer for the trenches and um, grade separation structures. These are some of the people that have worked on the project. Um, our overall scope um, included, uh, just for our structures, um, about 100 boins and 100 CPTs along the 29 mile alignment. Um, they ranged in depth from um, 50 feet for some of the shorter embankments to 100 or 200 feet deep for the viaduct structures. Um, we also did drill two 500 foot deep borings at the Fresno River and the San Joaquin River um, and did seismic um, shear wave velocity testing in those deep borings so that we could do site response to see how the uh, seismic motions were affected by the recent channel deposits in those two rivers. Um, and we were in charge of the design of the drilled shafts and load testing program uh, for the viaduct structures. Um, those load tests were also used for the other structures along the alignment. Um, at the bottom of this slide is uh, one of the first drawings of the portion of viaduct structure over the San Joaquin River showing along um, span over the river, and then 100, you know, 100 foot spans for the other areas of the viaduct. 
uh, going over the floodplain and up into the higher ground. Just going to go over the geology of the area a little bit. Um, it's mostly alluvial fan and basin deposits that have come down uh, from the mountains to the east. Um, it's relatively old, um, though there's obviously more recent channel deposits in the, both the Fresno River and San Joaquin. Um, the San Joaquin it definitely is a um, more active channel, um, and so it has water year-round in it and has some younger channel deposits on the south bank of the river. Um, generally, bedrock's down very deep, um, a mile or more. Um, so all our explorations were through the alluvial deposits, the maximum depth, depth explored. Um, the alluvial deposits um, consisted of a mixture of sands, the silty sands, mostly the silts. Um, there were a few clay layers. Uh, low counts in the upper 20 to 40 feet could range from 15 to up to refusal, just depending on the area. Um, we did get some, we do have some hard pan areas at shallow depths of cemented soils, um, but then uh, especially at depths of 60 feet or more, um, both the borings and CPTs encountered cemented soils. Um, with blow counts, usual, usually refusal blow counts. Um, we had many CPTs that hit refusal um, at depths before we reached our target depths of 100 feet. Um, yeah, these are the four soil profiles for the four load test sites I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, Here's overall our drill shaft flow test program for the project um, that we completed. Um, there were four sacrificial load test shafts. Uh, they were full size matching the production shaft diameters, eight to 10 feet. Um, one shaft was located up north in the Fresno River or near the Fresno River. Um, two of the load test shafts were located at the San Joaquin River, uh, one kind of out of the floodplain area and one down um, near, near, closer to the river channel. Um, and then we had another load test at, down at the downtown Fresno viaduct, which was the third viaduct down in the south part of Fresno that was going over the highway. Um, our shaft lengths for these load tests varied from 80 to 100 feet, um, kind of matching what we estimated for the production shafts before we completed the load testing. Um, and we were able to load the axial load tests um, up to 11,000 to 18,000 kips. Um, and lateral load tests, we were able to test up to 2,000 to 2,500 kips in lateral. Um, yeah. uh, obviously, for the axial, here's a kind of a, overview of the axial and lateral load tests. We, um, because we were doing on such large shafts, um, to such large loads, um, we couldn't do a conventional static load test where we um, did a load frame up at the surface. So we had to use a bi-directional um, setup for the load test um, where you place a load cell down at depth, some distance above the end of the shaft. Um, and then that load test is hydraulically um, load cells hydraulically increased in pressure. Um, and so it pushes down on the bottom of the load test and it pushes up on the top part of the shaft. Um, and so it, it can use the capacity of the bottom part of the shaft as a reaction system for the top and use the load from the top as a reaction for the bottom of the shaft. You do have to try to determine where you would need to put that load cell based on your best as judgment of capacity before you do the load test um, so that your load up and down are equal 
or as close to equal as possible so that you were able to fail the upper part of the shaft at the same time that you're failing the bottom part of the shaft. Um, as you'll see a little bit later, you don't have to have the displacements be equal. Um, the bottom part of the shaft will move a lot um, more than the upper part of the shaft based on in-bearing um, beam. You're having to move the end a lot more to mobilize the in-bearing than the side resistance in the upper part of the shaft. Um, we also, you know, place the strain gauges. We use strain gauges throughout the shafts, um, generally at changes in stratigraphy. Um, we obviously completed a uh, drill boring in each of these locations before we designed the load test so that we had good stratigraphy and blow counts and um, data for our estimated capacities before we started to design the load tests. Um, also, on this project, we were able to um, space out um, the completion of each load test in time so that we were able to, we completed the Fresno River load test um, quite a, uh, I believe, probably a couple months before we did some of the San Joaquin or downtown Fresno Viaduct load tests. So we're able to use some of the information we were getting from the first load test and the subsequent load tests. Um, and I think even the San Joaquin, we did one test at the San Joaquin River and the next test, um, we were able to adjust the length of the shaft and the location of the load cell a little bit based on the results we got from the first test. Um, so we did axial tests in each of the four test shafts. We also did rapid load tests, lateral tests um, for each of the shafts. Um, obviously, in California here, seismic uh, loads are taken into consideration. So we wanted to, and so some of the shafts are actually controlled by the lateral load on them, depending on where they are in the viaduct structures. Uh, so we did do rapid load tests. Um, again, uh, just this overall guide on how we installed the shafts. Um, there were 10 to 14 foot diameter PMPs in the upper 20 feet to stabilize the surface soils before the rest of the shaft was drilled. Um, we did do slurry in all the shafts. There are some clean sand layers that um, had, you know, the likelihood of caving into the shafts um, during the installation. So slurry methods were was used um, because of the tight rebar spacing, um, higher slump than normal concrete was used for the shafts, um, and we did do camera inspections down at the base of each shaft excavation make sure they were clean. Um, we had um, generally deposits less than a couple inches thick down at the bottom for each of the inspections. Um, and here's the results of the axial load testing for the four test shafts um, showing on the, the bottom portion or bottom kind of three quarters of the plot shows the displacement downwards and the load downwards. Um, and then the upper portion shows the load pushing up. Um, as you can kind of see in the plot, at least three of the shafts, we were able to almost fail in the upward direction at least, um, T1, T3, T4. Um, yeah, those are the, T1 is the Fresno River load test shaft, T4 is the downtown Fresno down in the south, and then T2 and T3 are at the San Joaquin River. Um, T3 is the one that we were able to adjust after we got the results um, for the T2 test shaft. Um, so we were able to shorten the shaft and place the load zone in certain locations so that we were able to fail the shaft upwards um, because you can see T2 um, didn't really start to um, fail the upward part of the shaft and even downward, um, it was still increasing, increasing in capacity. Um, and overall, just for T2, we, we, we reached the capacity for the load cell, and that's why we had to stop the, the test. Um, we were targeting a failure 
criteria of 5% of the shaft diameter. Um, so we were able to reach those kind of displacements in, in varying, uh, or at least get close um, for the shaft that we were able to fail. Um, you know, the downtown Fresno Viaduct low test shaft, we were able to displace the end of the shaft more than seven inches down and it create continue to increase in load uh, in bearing capacity. Um, and here's a comparison of what, how we, the capacity that we predicted before the test to what we predicted after from the test. Um, it's the lines are, you know, we took our exploration and applied uh, the correct equations to calculate the capacity as if, you know, any, if it, the tip was at different depths. Um, and then the dots here um, were, are from the test. Um, as you can see, generally, um, the measured values were close to what we predicted. Um, the side resistance in, in, in total were a little bit higher. Um, we think this was up in the Fresno River. This is the first load test that we did. Um, we think maybe some of this could be contributed to that the first, it was the first test shaft that they installed for the project. And they, you know, obviously had some starts and stops as they were constructing it. There's always kind of issues with the first one they get out on the site with. Um, so then here's the capacity and predicted capacity for the next shaft that was at the San Joaquin River. And as you can see, um, the predicted capacity for the end is pretty close to what was measured for the load test, but the side resistance and thus the total resistance um, are about 50% higher um, than what we would what we predicted before using the expression at the site and typical equations. Um, and this kind of shows um, all the tests predicted versus um, measured for the tests, uh, just a ratio between the two for the side resistance, especially. Um, and what it's kind of trying to show that at, you know, in the upper 60 feet of each of the test shafts, you know, there's some scatterer between the predicted and the measured values, but below a value of a below a depth of 60 feet, at least for the San Joaquin River and downtown Fresno Vida to chefs. Um, we always um, measured side resistance values that were um, 30 to as much as twice, 30% more, 100% uh, more higher than what we had predicted using the expirations at the site. And we think this has con contributed uh, by the cemented soils at this depth and that the standard equations that we use for drilled shaft capacities didn't quite capture that increased capacity in those kinds of soils at depth. Um, and here's just uh, looking at the in bearing, um, just plots of the four test shafts versus a typical uh, plot of the displacement versus in bearing, both normalized both by the diameter or by the total capacity at 5% of the diameter. Um, you can see that the test shafts were generally followed the similar trend um, for a cohesionless sandy soil. And you can see that they would have, you know, continue to eat, increase in capacity as you went out beyond 5%. Um, but these are, obviously, these are obviously at high displacements for these large shafts of five, six, seven inches of displacement at the end in order to mobilize these ultimate capacities. Um, and here's the overall load displacement curves for the load for the axial tests. Um, you can see that kind of are, you know, they're a little bit stiffer than published curves. Um, at lower displacements, so then they would continue to increase in capacity out beyond 5% of the shaft diameter. Um, but they're still obviously um, bending over. Um, 
So we still took our ultimate displacements, our ultimate capacities at 5% of the shaft diameters. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about the lateral load tests a little bit. Um, here's a quick video of the rapid load test. So, I mean, again, that's a rapid load test. There's a large weight mass um, that's placed on skids next to the test shaft. The test shaft's um, the concrete sticking out of the ground on the left. The mass is the blue block on the right. Um, there are explosives put in between the test shaft and the mass, and they're set off so that the reaction mass shoots back and imparts a load onto the test shaft. Um, here's the results. We did four um, loads for each of the test shafts, increasing in uh, weight of the reaction. Um, and we were able to displace the load, load shafts, um, at least in these two, you know, an inch to two inches. Um, and at the higher loads, um, again, these, these plots are showing in the yellow are the actual measured points for the lo four loads. Um, and then the red and green are two models for the, the test shafts after that it were done to um, try to get at the soil parameters that were that are correct for the load test shafts. Um, so the red line is a linear elastic model and the green line is a nonlinear model that accounts for cracking of the of the shaft. Um, and as you can see, generally when the shafts were displaced around an inch or more, um, they started to crack. Um, we also saw this in the strain gauge data um, that we had on the load tests. Um, as you can see, the, the measured test pile points start getting closer to the nonlinear modeled curve. And they start on the linear elastic curve. Um, but yeah, again, we were able to impart a, st a corresponding static load of about 2,000 to 2,500 kips in the lateral loads for the four test shafts. Um, and again, we calibrated soil parameters based on the lateral load tests. Um, these are the overall deflections versus lateral loads. These aren't normalized or anything for diameter. And obviously the soil conditions at each of the site differ. Um, but um, you can kind of at least see that we're able to start cracking the shafts and getting some good capacities out of them. Um, but we're able to calibrate the soil parameters and we got results that were stiffer than typical values. Um, Generally, it's our understanding that the published values for the stiffness parameters for lateral using like L-Pile um, are based on tests on smaller shafts. So we were able to test these large eight to foot, 10 foot diameter shafts and get higher values for the stiffness. Um, and thus um, realized that the shafts were gonna deflect less than what we had originally designed. Um, here's my overall con conclusions. Um, again, like I talked about before, the first test shaft of each side is always a little bit harder. Um, we think maybe our capacities were a little bit reduced because the hole was left open a little bit longer than um, the other test shafts and other production shafts as once they kind of got in the groove for the project. Um, Obviously, the way I talked about before, we believe the cemented soils at, at depth um, had higher capacities than we typically get from the typical equations. Um, and thus, we were able to increase the capacity side resistance of those of the production shafts at depth. 
um, and that allowed us to shorten the lengths of the shafts, um, sometimes by about 20 feet or more, um, and that reduced the cost of the production shafts by millions of dollars based on, um, obviously there's quite a few shafts for these long viaduct structures and other structures for the project. Um, this reduction was about 15% of the total installation costs for the project. Um, and overall, I mean, the testing, definitely testing sacrificial large diameter drilled shafts was expensive, but the cost savings from the testing, uh, we estimated be about three times the cost of the completion of the load test program. Um, so it was definitely saving the project a good amount of money. Um, I guess also just kind of a side note, I mean, Overall, even just doing, even if we had maybe not seen the increased capacities for the cemented soils, um, there's also just a cost savings by for doing the load test based on we can be a little bit more aggressive with our soil parameters. Maybe we don't have to take a worst case soil profile. If we're comfortable, hey, we're gonna do some load testing. Um, we're also able to use, for this pro project, we're using LRFD. So we're able to use um, resistance factors um, that were a little bit higher um, as because we were doing load tests and confirming that our capacities were accurate. Um, so there was already some initial savings from just understanding that we were gonna do load tests even before we did the load tests and realized we had higher capacities. Um, we've also, you know, this is just kind of detailing other work we've been we've been doing for high speed rail. Uh, we did do a society study, um, and we're also part of the design build team for construction package four, which is further south uh, between Fresno and Bakersfield. Um, and we did already complete a load test program for that project, also um, for the drilled shafts. Um, for that project, we were able to use um, load tests that were 50% of the um, production shaft diameters. Um, so we were able to save some money on the load test program there. Um, down in that area, we didn't see the same cemented soils, but we did see some slightly higher um, capacities. So we were able to um, realize some cost savings for that program project also. Um, and that's it. Hi, I'm here in Oakland. Okay, Kevin. Thank you very much uh, for uh, for this presentation. Um,